Hello, I'm Rupert Soskin. And I'm Michael Bott. Welcome to another Prehistory Guys interview, introducing you to people often hidden in the background whose work is really making a difference to our understanding of humanity in prehistory. Yes, and today we're talking with Dr Kenny Brophy, Senior Lecturer of Archaeology at the University of Glasgow. Kenny's work focuses mainly on the British Neolithic, particularly of Scotland, and he's written copiously about the many cursus monuments to be found there. Kenny is passionate about bringing archaeology into the public domain and is equally interested in how people have engaged with ancient monuments throughout history. Pursuing this theme, he writes a regular blog under the title of The Urban Prehistorian, exploring the roles that megalithic and other prehistoric sites continue to play within society. Apart from having directed numerous excavations in Scotland, he lectures widely and is always a captivating speaker, so we hope you enjoy the conversation as much as we did. Dr Kenny Brophy, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a long time coming. <laughs> yes. Welcome to the show. And uh, what's it like up there in sunny Glasgow? Uh, it's snowing. <laughs> it has been. It has been snowing. Oh, it? Yes. Yeah. There's been a bit of snow on and off for the last few days. So it's cold, miserable, damp, uh, drich. Yeah, just like that normal, one. really. Actually, it's uh, just like normal. Yeah, like four, yeah. four months of the year are, are essentially like this. So, <laughs> yeah, just just Glasgow's just the same as ever, really. It's, it's, it's reassuring yes, to yes. hear. <laughs> well, listen, the first question, we always ask everybody the same question because people do like to know, what is it that first got you into archaeology in the first place? Uh, well, uh, I mean, archaeology is not something that I set out to do. Uh, I didn't have any interest in, in it when I was at school. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to be a geographer. I wanted right. to make maps, oh. that kind of thing. Um, and so when I went to Glasgow Uni to do geography uh, and geology, I was looking for a third subject uh, and I worked at a um, bingo hall in Lark Hall, my hometown, believe it or not. And there was a, another guy who worked in the bingo hall who was a year older than me at school, um, Big Rob. And he did archaeology as a first year subject. And he said, look, if you do archaeology, um, I've got these old textbooks. I'll give you them, you know, for a fiver each. So... <laughs> I, I thought, well, I'd, I'd, fair enough. I didn't really have anything else in mind for a third subject. So, because in, in the Scottish system, we can do three subjects in first year, then narrows it down for uh, the degree choice. So, I took it on a whim. But and so, started in October, and by by Christmas, I was hooked. Um, and wow. I already decided I didn't want to do geography. I didn't want to be a geologist. I wanted to do archaeology somehow, and I wasn't really quite sure how. So, it, I came into it by chance, which many people do. Yeah. Uh, and it was uh it was just I was just sold on it very quickly and I didn't really Im imagine it was possible to become an archaeologist but I wanted to do yeah. a degree and then see where it took me so and um, that was really my background and when I look back to when I was a kid m my parents took me to castles to stone circles yeah. to historical sites and places but I don't remember I don't remember them any more than I remember going to play crazy golf or um, <laughs> or, right. or other childhood activities. So I don't I, I didn't grow up with a burning desire to be an archaeologist or even with a, a huge interest in um, the past. Although I enjoyed history at school, but mm. it was a it was a sort of chance bingo hall work association that probably tipped me in that direction. So uh, I don't really have a, I don't fun. have an origin story that's about my you know. <laughs> Be, right from the days of nappies being uh, do you know what? I, I think that's as good as any in fact it's it's, it's one of the finest we've heard <laughs> right, isn't it really <laughs> out of a bingo hall what, what, what was it what was the, the study or was it getting out in the field that uh you know had the penny um, drop for you i think it was the it was the study i mean i think oh, that really? getting out in the field was initially was something i wasn't and we did quite a lot of field trips and i realized that i was completely unfit so we went to hill forts and things like that, and I and I hated it because I couldn't get up to hill forts because I was, I mean, I'm I'm chubby now, but when I was when I was um, eighteen, I was chubby and completely unfit. And at least I'm fit oh, now. Right. So yeah. after years of doing stuff, so it just was exhausting. So I I, I preferred the I preferred the study. I, I think that what I really loved about it was the the potential to be creative and imaginative. Mm. So I enjoyed the fact that yeah. you know, especially prehistory, which drew me to that because. If, I felt as if there was a there was a lot of potential for um, being imaginative and to try and come up with narratives and stories that were interesting and engaging, and that you could weave stories amongst the evidence and 
So I, I like that potential. So it was, it, it felt for me, it, right from the start, it felt like something that was had a huge amount of potential to take me in some very interesting directions. So I was yeah. always interested in monumentality in particular because I like the challenge of trying to understand how these monuments were used. And I felt as if there was there was lots, even though there was decades of research that had happened, there was lots more potential. And, and so, yeah, so right from the start, it was, a, it was the intellectual challenge, I guess, and the, and the study. And it was only later on that I really started to appreciate the, the, the time spent outdoors, the excavations yeah. and all the other stuff, which, um, which, uh, you know, I came to really enjoy as well. But initially it was the, it was the kind of the intellectual challenge and the, and the, it was liberating. I think it felt liberating because at school, I'd always been told what to think. And, you know, there was always an answer. You know, if you did physics, there was always an answer. And maths, there was always an answer. In archaeology, yeah. there didn't always seem to be answers. And I quite like the idea of coming up with more answers. So it sort of was intellectually liberating, which is yeah, yeah. what initially drew me to it, I think, as well. And also, Before it's some really move on, inspiring uh, lectures, too. Yeah. Before we move on, can you say a bit more about, uh, say a bit about um, the job you're doing uh, right now and um, uh, what, what you do up at um, in, uh, Glasgow University? Well, yeah, so I'm well. I'm currently a senior lecturer in archaeology. Yep. I'm currently also the head of the archaeology subject area because we're not allowed to call it a department anymore. Um, but okay. <laughs> it is essentially a department. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm head of I'm, I'm head of the subject. So my job involves a fair degree of admin and sort of um, managing things and line managing staff, which is something that I'm quite new to and it's it's challenging, but 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 fun. Uh, but also, I do lots of teaching, obviously. So I, you know, I teach every level from undergraduate through to postgraduate. I've got PhD students that I work with, uh, and and then I've got the research side of what I do as well, which is, you know, supposedly a third of of my time. But just now, it's mm. it's a real fraction of my time because mm. it was just busy converting a lot of our teaching to online um, provision and so on. So, so the job is mm. it, it covers a huge amount of ground. I mean, it's the there's, every day has got it's a cliche but every day is different in terms of content like this morning i did a a two-hour training session with arts postgraduate students about public engagement and arts and humanities research i'm i'm helping out with a education teaching session on monday morning about work and um, working with trainee teachers and and then i've got lots of our own archaeology teaching to do as well and mm. it's just uh it's just it's, there's lots of different stuff but essentially just now I spend all of my time sitting in front of this laptop. I mean, that's, you know, I've, I've moved to a more comfortable position just now, but generally I'm sat at a laptop at a desk under current circumstances, just all yeah. the time. So yeah. it's that, that right. so my job is also very desk bound just now as well. I don't get out very often and um, oh. for obvious reasons. Mm. So, so the, the job is, and the, the job is quite different from what it used to be. I mean, I've been doing this. I started in 2000 at Glasgow. So I've been, a lot of my right. colleagues now were my lecturers in the 1990s. So I'm now their boss, which is great, <laughs> which is great. And um, now I can see what they've been getting away with for all these years. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a really friendly and small department. So there's about 12 of us. We're, we're quite close knit. We work well together as a team. And, you know, it's and we, we know that we know the students well. And, you know, it's, we've got, you know, nice numbers of students, especially in honours where we've got we get to know the students when they've been with us for four years. So it's a great place to work and it's it's good fun. And despite the fact that acad being an academic isn't the isn't the cushy number it was a few decades decades mm. ago, it's still a brilliant job, and it's it's got an amount of freedom that you get very rarely in the workplace nowadays. You don't have to check in and check out. You don't have to justify what you're doing for your time. Yeah. Quite often, my employers don't even know where I am or what I'm doing. You know, so it's 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 good in that respect, but it's also very demanding at times as well. So. Yeah. It's but all that's good. that's that's all great to hear, Kenny. I, I'm I'm really glad I I asked. You know, it's um it's not often you know, the question gets asked, and it's, it's good mm. to you know hear, hear the background and and your feeling about it. But anyway, I'm gonna do I'm gonna I'm gonna go for the first deep dive question, mm. here, mm -hmm. Kenny. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's something up your street. And, and a few years ago, BBC produced a series of films called. Uh, Britain's ancient capital, focusing on the on, yes. the, on the discoveries being made at the nest of Brogger mm -hmm. and or Orkney, and a lot of the findings got us all excited or you know exercised, whichever <laughs> way you, which, <laughs> take your pick, uh, and it sort of tried to skew some kind of imagined five thousand year old governing order in Britain towards the nest and away from mm -hmm. from Wiltshire, and also. 
you know, in the along the same lines, um, stretching out this Orcadian Wiltshire connection was a notion developed from strontium isotope studies that cattle from the northeast of Scotland that may have been feasted upon at Durrington Walls. So all these narratives are really attractive. And, you know, we have to confess to having paid lip service to them ourselves from time to time. We have. But, on the, but it's great to have you here because I think you're the chap to really, um, I don't know, um, uh, help us recalibrate that thinking, you know, and, and point out the dangers of that, that kind of thinking. Um, yeah, your thoughts. Yeah. Yes, well, I mean, if, if we go back to that, that particular TV programme, that was actually a really important moment for me because up until that time, I hadn't really thought about the role that archaeology could 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 play in terms of combining with modern politics and that program it deeply annoyed me and you know and people know that who know me they know that you know immediately I was tweeting and complaining and partly because of the title was nonsensical partly because of aspects <laughs> of what of the of the of the hypothesis that Neil Oliver was trying to develop in that program mm. um, and and for me what was really insightful was that when I was following the reaction to the program on Twitter people were tweeting they weren't tweeting about the archaeology they were tweeting about politics yes. so people were saying mm -hmm. things like you know um neil oliver is a well-known unionist so he's a he's a anti-scottish independence so a, a lot of an uh, smp independent supporters dislike him deeply <laughs> so that the, a narrative emerged on social media that this was a bbc scotland unionist propaganda piece okay. that was that was essentially wow. the viewpoint was that neil oliver was saying Britain has always been united and so therefore why should Scotland become independent because Ouch. you can yeah. take you can look at British independence going right back to the Neolithic period and part of Scotland was the capital of that of Britain at that time so I mean I don't I don't think for a minute that's what Neil Oliver was actually saying but that's how it was interpreted in, in the program so it made me realize actually there was a whole audience consuming archaeology in a, in a, and then reframing it within a modern political um, discourse which it surprised me it shouldn't have surprised me i suppose and i should have probably i was probably sheltered from it but it, social media allowed that to be exposed in a way that wasn't there before so something mm -hmm. that had, had long bothered me and also uh, gordon barclay who i've collaborated with for a long time was about the dominance of uh, the of basically wiltshire wessex whatever you want to call it and to a lesser extent orkney in british neolithic studies because these are places where stuff survives to a very high standard of preservation. Mm. They're famous sites, they're world heritage sites, and they've, they've drawn disproportionate amounts of funding and research energy and interest and all the rest of it. And so for those of the, those archeologists like me and Gordon who essentially spent the 90s digging in Perthshire or in Stirling or places like that, or I, I dug in Caithness in the in early 2000s, there was no place in, in these narratives of the British Neolithic for the unheralded regions mm. which essentially were regarded in these big scale narratives as being secondary considerations everything that everything that was innovated and invented in neolithic britain either came from the south or came from the north and everything in between was just this kind of sponge that sucked in and didn't have any say in what was happening so that had always annoyed me and then when that became tied in with the the kind of the the contemporary politics then it suddenly it really sparked my interest which is why since then i've, I've published a, quite a few papers about the relationship between brexit and prehistory and yeah, yeah. scottish independence and prehistory and also the narrative that you talked about michael this idea that that um, we have essentially stonehenge and durrington walls and the and the, the big super enclosures of the of, of wiltshire somehow being a central point around which everyone else in britain rallied in the late Neolithic, in this period that Mike Parker Pearson has characterized as a late Neolithic Brexit, where Britain was isolated from the continent. And then some this from there emerged a, a sort of a British cultural um, or a tribal unity, um, which is the, the kind of phraseology that's been used by researchers around around Mike and various others. And yeah. and and so that that and part of that narrative is based on the reading of the isotopic analysis that the animals the pigs and the cattle came from all over britain so when you actually look at the the studies that have been done um trying to 
argue that you know cows and pigs were coming from northeast scotland or even from orkney or, or for other parts of um, northern britain it's quite clear that you can argue that if you want looking at the isotopic evidence but there's also the isotopic evidence also suggests that these animals probably came from within a hundred kilometer radius of durrington walls and places like that um, and in particular from wales which has got the already got this sort of ancestral connection with the blue stones and so on at stonehenge so i mean if we're just going to apply occam's razor you know it seems to me more likely that the animals were sourced from relatively locally rather than from aberdeenshire mm-hmm. but if you have got a an agenda where you're trying to depict the neolithic of britain as being unified then of course you're going to highlight and emphasize the evidence that backs up that theory so therefore yeah. All Gordon and I have been arguing is that the, the isotopic evidence has been interpreted with a series of prior assumptions to make a certain argument in a certain case. And actually, in reality, the more you look at that, the more it falls apart as a as a, as a viable theory for a whole range of different reasons. Okay. And actually, the dominance of Stonehenge is such that the evidence evidence is being interpreted in ways that are not, not helpful. Um, and this is not to say that people and researchers have been deliberately misleading anyone reading arguments or that they have been or that they're lying or they're making this stuff up or, or that they're nationalists. Mm-hmm. All we're saying is that archaeologists have to be more careful about their prior assumptions and they have to be aware that if they have an agenda, then that's going to shape how they read the data. And th- a lot of people in British Neolithic studies have an agenda that's just Stonehenge, Durrington yeah. Walls and everything else sort of comes secondary and that's a tradition that goes back over a century where should we look for the antidote for that then kenny well the antidote Mm. to it is to is to stop fixating on stonehenge to stop fixating on neolithic orkney and to start celebrating studying researching the neolithic in other parts of of britain um Mm. that have that have had relatively little attention you know there are places in in britain that there's been virtually no study done. There's other places where a lot's been done and the evidence has never really been taken on board. There's huge amount of regional variation. There's yeah. evidence of kind of innovation and incredible monumentality and all sorts of things happening in places that never would never make news headlines. And yet they're, they're equally important in my view as to what's found in, in other major centers. So it's not about, it's not about saying that Stonehenge wasn't important or Orkney wasn't important because both were amazing places in the Neolithic and Early Bronze Age, and both were um, and both were significant centres. There's no doubt about that. But let's just recalibrate our view away from having these two polar opposites and actually yes. think about a series of power centres across all of Britain and also mm-hmm. in Ireland as well. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, that if we if we actually started to invest effort and energy and time and money into other places then we would start to find we'd start to potentially find stuff that would help us to recalibrate things so all i want all i want is a bit of rebalancing leveling up i hate i'm not i can't believe i'm using a a boris johnson phrase sorry rupert there's also no escaping the fact that uh, that the big settlements so whether it's london or glasgow or wherever that the, the archaeology has been erased. It's quite likely that the ancient, you know, the biggest settlements are still the biggest settlements, yeah. and there's just nothing that we could ever find to uh, to reinforce that. So, so interpreting any any remains out in the countryside as prehistoric capitals mm-hmm. is, you know, it's a very risky yeah. route yeah. to take. And, and we it's try very hard to diversify, you know, what we yeah, do yeah, and, and, try, yeah. and, uh, and expand mm-hmm. a bit. And along those lines, Rupert, you've got a couple of questions that, you know, speak to our particular interest. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you know, we came across your work, first of all, Kenny, when um, uh, we were researching Cursus. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, you know, they're, they're, or is it Cursus? Can we say Cursus? Or is no. it Cursus? Cursus. What is it, Kenny? Cursus. <laughs> Curses monuments. Yeah, pluralized the English part of the <laughs> phrase, not the Latin bit. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> but uh, no, we, um, so, you know, we first came across your work uh, on Cursus monuments and, uh, you know, also exploring their relationships with water and proximity <laughs> to water. And, you know, I mean, talk about, uh, tell us a bit about, you've got the archaeological niggle, you know, the Cursus problem. Um mm. You know, because we tell, we understand so little 
Um, and yet they are everywhere. I mean, how many have you got in Scotland? 60? Yeah, 50 or 60 across Scotland. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and they are everywhere, but they're also invisible. So you've got yeah. monuments that are largely crop marks. So they don't, you know, there's only a handful of cursus monuments in Britain that are visible above the ground, which automatically means that they have a, a lack of visibility and that, you know, most people haven't heard of them. So they, they you know, they're not, they're not, um, it's not a word that's in the common, yep. in the common um, kind of discord. We're doing our best. Yes. And it's, and, you know, and, and there's, it, there's certainly, I mean, it's, it's it, yeah, it's, it's something I've always been interested in. I mean, I, I did my undergraduate dissertation in 1994, 95 on Cursus Monuments, where I did a Chris Tilley-esque phenomenology of Cursus Monuments. And then I did my PhD, which developed that a bit more, looking across Scotland. And and I looked at the crop marks intensively and really visited dozens of sites. And and the thing is, the thing that always intrigued me about Cursus Monuments is they're so big. Um, they're, they're, they're huge monuments. And some of them are, you know, the biggest monuments ever constructed, you know, in, in Britain's past. The, you know, the Dorset Cursus is, let's go back to Wiltshire again, but the Dorset Cursus is, you know, <laughs> is not Wiltshire, Dorset, for goodness sake, w- Wessex. So the Dorset Cursus is 10 kilometres long. Stonehenge Greater Cursus is a few kilometres long. There's there's examples in Scotland that are several kilometres long. And these are enormous monuments, and they, and they would have taken up huge expanses of, of, of very good quality farming land on, in river valleys. And so... What intrigued me in the mid nineteen nineties was that why why is so little been written about Cursus monuments? Because up to that point, if you looked at textbooks, there was only ever a paragraph or two. You know, there was just oh, and there's these things that we you know that sort of are maybe early Neolithic and probably were processional routeways, and we can't say much more than that. You know, and and even the dating was really ropey. It was only really in the late yeah. it was only really in the late eighties into the early nineties that good dating came through. And so I was intrigued, and I wanted to try and pursue a bit more of the, these, these sites and, and i kind of started to realize actually there's lots of different things going on because the label cursus contains lots of different types of sites you know so there's big earthwork enclosures mm. there's quite narrow almost avenue like things there's um sites that have got single mounds in the middle rather than double banks and ditch arrangements and then in scotland we've got the timber variations which are rectangular enclosures defined by lots of oak posts so there's lots of different things going on, and so the label cursus is actually hiding a lot of variation, but they're all they're all mm-hmm. big rectangular structures of the early Neolithic. So one of the yeah one of the first things that I thought about was the relationship with water. Um, so I think in the late nineties, I actually wrote a piece for British Archaeology magazine, but which was about was about um, I think at the time I had this idea because I was I was very theoretically minded when I was a, when I was a younger, <laughs> not so much now, and I was I was <laughs> I, I was I was really interested in symbolism because I was sort of I was a child of post processionalism, <laughs> and I was interested in the relationship between the visual relationship between cursus monuments and rivers, yes. and I had this idea that cursus monuments were actually um, attempts by humans to recreate straight rivers <laughs> i don't really know it sounds daft now that i see it yeah, yeah. Um, and so and basically these so cursus monuments were like kind of like humanly created river type features that would have had waterlogged ditches at certain times of the years because they were mm. low-lying yeah, floodable yeah. areas and so at times they look like rivers as well and so i had all these different kind of symbolic metaphors and then i published a paper in the late 90s that was entitled water coincidence which was, which is, <laughs> which is a high point of my career, where I, I kind of, I kind of explained this idea in a lot more detail, and and it was a, it was a big deal for me at the time because I felt as if it was the first ever theory I'd had. I felt like it was my idea, and oh. that no one had said this before, and yeah. um, I was really excited. I mean, it, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, it's a bit daft really now when I look back on it, but it was really important. But then in the end of my PhD, it only ended up being about a paragraph because I'd, by then I'd kind of moved on and had other thoughts about it. And I was actually becoming quite um, cynical about what we could say about these sites, you know, with mm. these sort of theoretical mm. perspectives like phenomenology. So, so I think that, yeah, I've, I think that there's, a, they have a relationship with water because they are spatially close to water. They often align on riverways and, um, and they, they almost certainly would have had, flooded at times as well and may have been quite kind of boggy places at times so mm. i think i think there is a relationship there but i don't think it's quite as straightforward as their the symbolic relationship that i once thought but I, they're, they're a good example of the of something that 
I, I was able to be creative about and actually think, well, you know, what are these things? You know, what were they used for? Let's pull together the evidence we know and look at their landscape location and their form and start to have a narrative that might make sense. And, you know, and and as, as with all ideas in archaeology, some some are good, some are mediocre, and some are you know, some you never you never really work out whether they're they're good or not. And so, I'm I'm quite happy to reflect on these <clears throat> youthful ideas and think, well, okay, that was interesting, but maybe it's it's more nuanced and complicated than that. So, yeah, but it's, they have a special yeah. place in my heart Don't because you... it was it was kind of where I first got my voice as an archaeologist, I suppose. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, an important work too. Now, the thing is, you. What's really nice about so much of your work is that you, um, you, you just turn things on their heads sometimes. And one of the things that uh, you know, I was reading some of your stuff about uh, you know hinges and palisaded enclosures, and one of the things that you said, and it was just such a wonderful moment for me, was when you said that hens should be a verb rather than a noun. You know that you hinge a monument. You know if you're making a ditch in a bank, that's hinging. Yes. And and I just thought that was such a brilliant uh, way of seeing uh, the problem because it, it makes so much more sense to look at it that way. And uh, that you know whether it's a cursus or a hinge or any other enclosure that that hinging as a verb just makes solid sense. And do you think there's a connection? I mean, for the people building them, you know that the the shape, you know, so whether it's rectangular as a cursus or whether it's circular as a as a hinge, you know, that what do you think that the purpose of hinging would have been? Well, I mean, I think the, the that that kind of concept of the hinge as a verb is one that's not universally liked. You know, I know that um, uh, Tim Darvel hates it. <laughs> he's and he's told me that um and not everyone agrees but i think for me it makes a lot of sense and actually now you've said that i do wonder whether we should also regard cursus as a verb as well um i'll need to have a think about that but henge lends itself better to henging something cursus saying something is not quite so so tidy well, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit messy really but Certainly i think yeah stuff out of its pigeonhole doesn't it yeah it, it, yeah mm. it, it, it does yeah and i think that um for me there's, there was some really interesting research in the in the late nineties that that started to flip the narrative of henges to think about them as being places that contained something because they mm. had internal ditches, with the idea being that the the ditch is the is a defensive element I suppose or the element that's the boundary that's that's difficult to pass rather than the bank which is I think is probably actually a, a modern perception really but we take that from you know thinking about castles and moats and all that sort of thing yeah, yeah. so there was a bit of research around that that came out of some irish um, iron age sites and then people like uh, gordon barclay and um and jan harding and others started to think about that in a henge context and so it seemed to me to make a lot of sense that because henges always enclose something there's always something older there you know whether it be a, a, some a, a timber structure or a burials or some deposition or a place where people gathered etc and so it made a lot of sense to me that there was a there was a process going on where these areas were being enclosed off and that and that the narrow entrance way and, and the disproportionately large ditches were about trying to make a point about that place not being accessible anymore except to a select few and that if you if you think about Colin Richards' um, really nice work that he's done looking at the concept of wrapping, which he's taken from his Polynesian research but applied it to stone circles in, in northern Britain, you know what you what you've got is a process of something taboo being wrapped off and, and blo blocked out from general use for the general protection of society, um, and that to me that that seems like a really compelling idea and a, a much a much kind of a much more sensible idea than just imagining these were enclosures that were like basically like Neolithic churches that were just a, a, a ritual structure where people did stuff. And, and I think that this, this seemed to me to make more sense. And and because I've been working at Fortivia and we excavated several henges there um, as part of the, the SERF project that I directed, um, those sites seem to me to be have these recurring phases of timber structures and activity or like cremation burial de deposition and so on and then you have these henges with quite ridiculously big earthworks but quite small interior areas constructed and very narrow entrances 
and then and, and that's really happening in the Copper Age. And then beyond that, you've then got burials being inserted into these sites in the Bronze Age, and probably the sites being converted into cairns or mounds. Mm. So you've also got mounding happening as well. And it's almost as if the henging wasn't enough. You know, whatever was there, they then had to they had to do something else. They had to mound the sites as well. They had to bury them and completely put them beyond use, as if as if you know, as if they were like nuclear waste. They had to be completely sealed away. You know, a belts and brace approach. And so one of the henges at Fortivia, the entrance to the henge was completely removed. They dug away the causeway and then they put a bank, presumably around the whole thing, and turned it into a barrow or, mm-hmm. or, or mm-hmm. less likely a cairn. So mm-hmm. we've got. I think that I think these processes are about people dealing with the past and dealing with either their their own ancestral past or the past of a different cultural tradition that they decide that they they have to shut it down and they have to put it beyond use in the same way as bent metal work is buried in the bronze age and iron age to, to put it beyond use for for in hordes and so on so yeah so the the, the verb henge was something that sort of seemed to work for me in that context and it's yeah, yeah and it's and it's yeah. not universally liked but i like it <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's yeah even yeah. no, though i mean uh full disclosure i mean we, we've been developing our own narratives around you know mm. attempting to around uh, uh curses monuments and and yeah. henges yeah. and uh i don't think there's enough time here to sort of dive into that mm. but it'd be great it'd be another conversation again you know because you've mm. done the work there and uh you know you, you're coming from um well, doing work in the in the field, and it's really important for us you know, to uh, developing our narrative. So uh, maybe that's a conversation for another, <laughs> another yeah, day. Yeah. Yes, otherwise we'll be all here. Day. Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. But I would, I would encourage <laughs> you definitely to you know, don't. I don't think that the the people who do the do excavations and do that stuff have, have a no, monopoly on ideas. And I think that you know people like yourselves who actually read the literature and spend time thinking about it and discussing it and knocking ideas and about. I think that's I think that's great as well. You know, I think that I don't think I've, I'm necessarily got a more privileged insight just because I happen to have stood beside a trench and ordered <laughs> students to trowel in a certain place. <laughs> so, no, but, but everybody's got their own perspective and, you know, it's when yeah, they yeah, come together, you know, yeah. and, and mm. feed into each other. That, that's yeah. the important thing. It, you know, the, the title of our film, Standing with Stones, is not accidental mm-hmm. because, you know, we very much feel that so, so often being in the presence, you know, feeling the, the, the space uh, and just standing in the same places as, ancestors mm-hmm. did that it, it feeds into uh, you know absolutely whatever yeah. you think however um another uh, strong passion of yours is your own uh, blog the mm. uh the urban um prehistorian the urban prehistorian that's right yes I first came across the urban prehistorian I think because I was thinking about going down to Dorchester and mm. mooching about in the uh, Waitrose car park, yeah, Waitrose where car park. Yes, yes. If, if, if you're <laughs> alert, you'll find large yellow discs in the, uh, for, or are mm. they red? I think they're yellow, are they? They're orange. Yellow, they're yellow. yeah. <laughs> orange. Well, Which, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> One of those colors. We're agreed on the side of the spectrum. <laughs> <anyway>. <laughs> Which uh, represent enormous timber posts from a, uh, yeah, a huge uh, ringed uh, timber monument that stood uh, in the, what is now central Dorchester. And that's, you know, aside from the fact that you've got Mount Pleasant out to the east and the Monbury Rings just to the, the, the south as well. So I was going to do a thing on that. But anyway, I came across Urban Prehistorian. And this, um, what you seem to emphasise there is the, the fascination of how people relate to sites in their own way. And... Um, and old or new so i'm just wondering what was your view i know that you've spoken about it what's your view or how do you feel about modern or uh, certainly not prehistoric mm-hmm. megalithic follies cropping up here and there and there seemed to be so much more of that stuff mm. than than yeah. uh, we're aware of mm. yeah it's, it's a it's a it's a growing trend i think um mm. and there's i'm not quite sure exactly what's underlying it i mean there's this sort of things that I've been thinking about over the last few years. I mean, I've always been interested in um, the the ambiguity between the past and the present. So, you know, sites like uh, Balfour Henge in Glenrothes and Fife, which is a 
essentially a reconstructed henge. And it's, it's the original henge, but the ditch has been cleared out after an excavation by Roger Mercer in the 70s. Yeah. And, then the, and then there was reproduction of aspects of the monument in advance of the building of a housing estate. Oh. And that was and that site's always fascinated me because I couldn't quite work out if it was actually a prehistoric henge or a 1970s henge or something in between. And and then when I started to look think about these things a bit more, looking at, you know, like Site Hill Stone Circle in Glasgow, which is a stone circle that was built by Duncan Lunan in 1979 to try and prove that archaeoastronomy was actually a reality. Yeah. And so he built an astronomical line stone circle. That was a site that people said to me, well, it's not a real stone circle because it's it was built in 1979. But then what is it if it's not a stone circle? So <laughs> in a way that, you know, yeah. We're, we're we're completely caught up in these assumptions that uh, that things are only legitimate, car- uh, authentic if they're actually genuinely old. And yet, you know, you guys know as well as me that how much of Stonehenge is actually authentically as it was erected back in um, the third millennium BC. You know, how how mm-hmm. much concrete holds that place together? You know, and mm-hmm. and how much of it was fallen over in the last century. And it's the same with like Stone Rose and Dartmoor and all sorts of other monuments that have been have had various different modern afterlifes so i think that now more recently i've been starting to think in a more focused way i mean you know i'm I'm quite interested to try and build up a gazetteer of stones stone circles inside roundabouts because there's i mean i've i've, I've made this bold claim recently on my website that um that i think there's more that i think there are more stone circles inside roundabouts in britain now than there were built in prehistory so I'm going to have to try and prove that now. But even if I just drive around where I live in Lanarkshire, there's that you know there's half a dozen roundabouts with stone circles of various different forms, and I'm fairly sure there's lots of them all over the place. And Gareth Rees has written about this in his in various different books about um, uh, about um, un- a hidden Britain, unexplored Britain, and, and you know stone circles outside sh- um, shopping malls and so on. Yeah. Brilliant. But I mean, that's just why. Why do people do that? You know, and then you get s- lots of standing stones are are, are, are um, used to make things like war memorials. Um, that you know, Howard Williams mm. has written about um, a megalithic war memorial in the the National mm. Arboretum. There's one in Cardiff as well. You know, there's like a memorial that looks like a dolmen. And yeah. then you've also got um, replica stone henges all over the place. There's a there's sure. a um, there's a, a clone henge person who runs Nancy. a uh, yeah yeah you know, you know Nancy well yeah. Yes, she's documented <laughs> over 80. Of this, you know, there's more than that now, probably 100 replica stone henges around the world, which is just yeah, weird. Yeah, you yeah. know, why are people doing that? One of, one of most... our favourites is uh, by mm. the Danny Rogoff Caves. Um, uh, <laughs> North Beckons. Uh, it's oh, about, it's about, about 200 yards from a dinosaur theme park. Oh, so it's got yeah. a hole. That sounds, that sounds, I'm going to have to visit that. <laughs> that sounds yeah, great. I can good. do a blog about that. It's, <laughs> it's impressive. It's a really good circle, actually. Uh, yeah. yeah, but you know, we, we've made the observation uh, a number of times that, that there is this presumption that uh, that that it was uh, like an unbroken culture, but we absolutely have n- no real knowledge. Or we, we can't say for certain that uh, that any of the Bronze Age circles weren't follies of their own uh, period, where they didn't know what the Neolithic circles were about, and they were just building one because we'll have one of those yeah yeah that's uh, yeah that's very likely that it's quite possible. yeah i think so that's a nice idea and i think that you can imagine that there would have been replication of more ancient features you know they got you know i mean passage graves in orkney are retro passage graves because they are yeah. you know they are they are like a second flourishing then the clava cairns and inverness are, are a third flourishing of yeah. megalithic tomb building in northern britain so I think that there's definitely that kind of thing was was going on, and that you know, these traditions were in the same way as people built brocks in the south of Scotland centuries after brocks were sort of in use in northern in northern Scotland. Was that you know the idea is that it was lowland chiefs who quite liked the idea of brocks because they'd been on holiday in Sutherland and they wanted their own brock, and so there was a kind of a, a flourishing second secondary tradition. So I think these things are absolutely absolutely possible, and the other the other. Um, new tradition which i'm really interested in and you guys will be aware of is the is the the current fashion for constructing um columbarium in the shape of a uh, barrows uh, or the form oh, of long yes. barrows in particular yeah, yeah. so um all cannings um yeah. which is constructed by tim daw um yeah. and quite close to west kennet 
uh, yeah. is, is was started something off and there's now um, half a dozen in England there's a few yeah. in the planning process as well so I've been working with a, a PhD, my PhD student Andrew Watson to get some funding to try and investigate that phenomena a bit more yeah. because these are literally are marketed as being replica prehistoric megalithic burial monuments but you can be buried in them um, and your, cremate, yeah. your cremated remains and they're really amazing right. places when you visit them to, to, to wander about oh, inside they and, are. we know yeah, the guys yeah. quite quite well and their, their heart's so in the right place as well in, yeah, in terms yeah. of yeah. where they want to go yeah, with and them. It, it sort of says something interesting about how people today connect prehistory with sort of um, ecolo ecologically sound and sustainable practices and um, and going back to nature and you know, maybe things that are maybe more pagan rather than necessarily part of a kind of mainstream religion. Yeah. And I think that there's actually, there's something about modern Britain, which is actually reflected in that trend, which is why we want to explore it. Because, you know, why why are, is this prehistoric form being used again now? Why are people drawn to that? Why do they sell out the niches like as soon as they go on sale? So yeah. there's an interesting phenomenon yeah. there. People have, a, have engagements with prehistory in a whole range of different ways, almost yeah. like even, even they don't even know it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really, you know, that echoes your work in its way. I mean, so much of your work is focused on people's relationships with archaeology. Mm. And I mean, you've written about psychogeography and phenomenology in archaeology. And one of the things that I'm intrigued by is, so you've got the phenomenological aspect here. You know, do you feel that we can ever really get close to sharing the experiences of our ancestors? Oh, it's, it's a good question because... Uh, if you'd asked me that 25 years ago, I would have said, yes, I think we can. But I, th I think actually it's mm -hmm. it's difficult because there's so many modern intrusions in the way. It's really difficult to to imagine yourself out of that situation. You know, the whole idea of phenomenology is that you experience a monument, a landscape, um, and then you have a similar bodily or sensory experience to someone who was there 5,000 years ago. Which in in way, in a way is correct, you know that you can you can duplicate aspects of that, but also you then have to start to imagine away all of the modern things that are happening, you know, field boundaries and roads and the noise of cars, planes flying overhead, all this all the sorts of things that which just mean that it's difficult to have an authentic experience anywhere. Uh, so, I mean, my my feeling about it is that it's more useful to reflect on the experiences we have now and how that helps us to understand the the monuments in their in their in their current st state in their current in their current terms rather than to imagine that we are going back into the the past and imagining ourselves in the shoes of a neolithic person which is what chris tilly was explicitly trying to do back in the 1990s in particular mm -hmm. uh, i don't think we can do that um, because there's too much going on in our minds you know because if you visit right. a long barrow as an archaeologist you're thinking this is a long barrow and what are but all the other long barrows i know about and all the long barrows I know about, what are they used for and what date were they built? And it's just all this baggage that we have. Whereas if you're a Neolithic person who is walking up to a long barrow, you know, yeah. that you have a totally different set of um, things in your mind about, you know, oh, my grandfather's buried in there or I helped build that or, you know, I've heard stories about this place. So it's really difficult to, to also get into the intellectual mindset of being mm -hmm. coming to that not as an archaeologist so i think that it's, it's really difficult i think there's an ab absolutely a value to experiential approaches to try and suggest new lines of inquiry and different ways of thinking about the past which is why i'm interested in psychogeography because it's about trying to um, replicate route ways in the past in the, 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 in the in the past that you can that maybe again give you a sense of how the landscape hung together mm. but ultimately all we can really do is document our own contemporary experiences and and to what extent that really helps us crack the, the the nut of what these things were being used for and how they were used in prehistory, I'm not entirely sure. But I think it's I think that you can't understand uh, a Neolithic long barrel by looking at aerial photographs or looking at excavation plans or anything like that. You have to if you get on the ground, go in, walk about, experience the monument, see what it is in the landscape. It can't do any harm. It might mm. it might be a modern contemporary experience, but it's still useful. And I think earlier on you were talking about being in the footsteps of the ancestors that connection is really important as well you know even though it's it's emotional and it's cheesy i think actually it does add a power to the experience as well and it gives you a sense that these are special places even yeah. if we can't quite put our finger on why they were special yeah perfect i had, I had an extraordinary experience because before the uh the long barrow 
um, uh, that Tim, um, oh, what's his name? Up, up in Tim, the, uh, which one? The all cannings? Uh, no, not cannings. Oh, Tim Ashton. Uh, yeah, Tim Ashton yeah, yeah. uh, up there uh, near his home, and uh, they haven't finished it off. I remember mm. sitting um, up the top of on on the top of the capstan before it had started mm. being uh, covered up, and uh, just thinking, well, that's a shared experience. Um, <laughs> think, th thinking about, well, how much earth is, is it going to take the, to cover the mound behind me mm. now? Yeah. Uh, what's the effort involved? Now, I could see a JCB digger just there that I knew it was going to do most of the work. Mm. But it, it, I was just found myself in the mindset of solving the problem. Uh, just uh, mm. not that it's going to take me anywhere or really educate me, but uh, being in that space and and mm. looking at that problem yeah. that way, I felt was a very privileged. Uh, yeah, it's quite it's sobering. I mean, I visited last yeah. year, or I visited them, um, or no, it wasn't last year; it was the year before I visited uh, Higher Ground Meadow, which is near Dorchester. It was the same trip that when I went to see the mm. Waitrose Car Park, and um, <laughs> it was it was only partially constructed, and it was mind boggling the scale of it. It was just you thought this yeah. is yeah. you know how much earth is needed, the amount of stone and sarsen and so it, it gave you an insight into the scale of these sites uh, because it was a building site that you would never get if you actually saw the finished site with a mound over it where it all looks quite straightforward and clean and simple whereas mm. to actually see the guts of it is, is is really informative so yeah that's that's absolutely true mm. so kenny what i find really remarkable what i've sort of gleaned is what's remarkable in your approach to your discipline is I feel for the most part that instead of running away to a corner with your data and then uh, re-emerging with an explanation that, um, uh, f from studying the data, your instinct is to actually involve the people that the archaeology will affect, the, mm. the communities in the immediate locality, and to try and engage um, the local public what, with what's... Um, yeah going on under their mm. Uh, mm. noses, you know, to engage them with their own prehistory. Yeah. Now, what I'd like you to do, because nothing exemplifies this, it's a sort of microcosm of that sort of thought process, is the um, it, it, your involvement with the, the Cochno Stone. Mm. Uh, and I, the, the whole arc of that story is so wonderful. <laughs> I think, yes. you know, as we're coming towards the end, I, I think it's a lovely story for people to mm. to hear you know first by you know kicking off saying what the cochno stone is what the yeah exactly and nicely pronounced as well <laughs> i remember <laughs> i did a i did a live radio interview in uh, with bbc radio scotland in the studio during the excavations at cochno and the, the person said to me you know so tell us about the cochno stone <laughs> and so yeah. so the first thing i did was i corrected the interview or live on radio so uh, yeah it's <laughs> quite yeah, right uh, yeah i know it's uh, um yeah but it's it, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's an it's an amazing story and it, it's one that it begged to be to have the involvement of the local community because it's a it's in an urban location which is what drew me to it in the first place and also i was invited to go and be involved by various different people um i, I sort of knew about the story it's a sort of mythical site in scottish archaeology because mm -hmm. Uh, it's an enormous rock art panel. Um, it's about 100 uh, square meters surface of this um, kind of uh, uh, whale back sort of shape um, sandstone block covered in hundreds of symbols, cup and mark, sim cup and ring mark symbols. And it was uh, and it was discovered in the 1980s, 1890s and documented. And then it sort of became a bit of a visitor attraction. But then in 1937. Uh, Ludovic Mann, who you could probably do another whole program on. Yes. Um, <laughs> We'd love to. <laughs> we <was could>. a, <laughs> the eccentric character. Uh, and he and he decided to paint the entire surface of the Cochrane Stone using oil paints. Um, and I've been I've I've published a paper in January, actually, in, in, sorry, December in the Scottish Archaeological Journal about what he was trying to do. It's very complicated, but it was ben basically a combination of trying to explain Neolithic cosmologies, prehistoric measurement schemes, and also something to do with eclipses as well. So mm. there was five different things going on when he did this paint job, which must have taken him weeks because it's mm. it's incredibly detailed and involves at least five different colours of oil paint. So you can imagine this is a, a scheduled. Well, it was it was it became scheduled quickly after that. So this is a <laughs> you know imagine any prehistoric rock art panel in Britain. Imagine someone just painting the whole thing. It's just incredible, and mm. that and that seems to then have caused problems because people came to visit 
because this was there was media attention. Clearly, this was a, a quite a sight. You know, it would be a very impressive thing. Um, people were moving into the area because of the Glasgow overspill in the fifties and sixties. Housing estates were being built, and then more and more people were visiting the sites, and they were annoying the landowners. People were carving their names into the stone. Mm. Um, so you know, and k- kids were doing that in particular. And I think they were emboldened by the fact that Ludovic Mann had already painted it, you know, so it wasn't like it wasn't already in a bit of a state. So by the time it came to the mid-60s, the stone was covered in paint. It was covered in dozens of bits of graffiti and people were doing, you know, I think people were setting fires on it and stuff like that and there was all sorts going on. And so it was decided by the Office of Works at the time to bury the stone to protect it from any more damage. So the order was given in 1965, and then it was it was just basically there was a wall around the stone that was pushed in. The whole thing was covered in about half a meter to a meter's worth of claggy soil from nearby fields, and then that was sort of it. They, they didn't have any strategy as to what to do next, and mm-hmm. the local community who actually, um, despite the fact that people had carved their names on it, that was actually because it was a local landmark. It was a local tradition. People felt very fondly about this site. They called it the Druid Stone. And it was one of several other rock art sites in the area. So people locally were disenfranchised from this incredible site almost overnight without any consultation. And so essentially it became this kind of um, this lingering sore that, that kept on going for half a century. So when we uncovered it again in, um, in 2016 with the uh, Factum Foundation, a, a Spanish-based digital heritage organization who who did the, who did all the laser scanning work on Tutankhamun's tomb. So this was like a parallel project for them. And they did so, all so of the, that was the driver, was it? Was it the, getting yeah. The, the, yeah, mm-hmm. I see. Yeah, the drive, was, the drive was that they wanted to uncover it for the mm-hmm. 50th anniversary because they'd read media coverage and they wanted, um, and they wanted to do a digital uh, record, record of it, yeah. which they then could create into a 3D replica at some mm-hmm. point in the future, which is still yeah. potentially on the cards. Um, so, so they 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 got asked me to be involved, and and I was happy to come along. And so we uncovered it, and uncovering it, it kind of uncovered. It was like a you know, a cork coming out of a bottle, you know, of, of local sentiment and nostalgia and excitement, yeah. and lots of people just suddenly brought back memories of oh yeah, that's right, I I carved my name on the stone, or I used to go and play on it when I was a child. So we 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 knew people were playing marble games on the oh, stone because yeah. we found marbles during the un- uncovering of the stone, and, and why wouldn't and, you? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's perfect for it with all the cup marks, and and so, and it was it was just wonderful. So, and we actually spoke to people who carved, you know, carved their initials on the stone. You know, one guy, um, BS, um, he is known as because that's his initials on the stone. He, he was a child. He broke his pen knife carving his initials onto the stone, and it's also so. So there's this just it was an incredible layering of all these different things, you know, and it, it's a stone that, that people have been unable to resist making their mark on for 5,000 years, which is, is really a really compelling story. And, yeah. and it's now, and it's now there's a lot of enthusiasm across um, Faithfully, which is an area that has, is very deprived and, and needs, a, needs a positive good news story. And so a lot of people who, who are based in local housing associations and locally see the rock art as being a, a better future for Faithfully, where it can become a tourist destination or, pe- or pl- a place that's known for its rock art and not known for drugs or unemployment or crime or any of the other things that people associate with um, areas of social deprivation. So it's gone from being like a, a, a technical recording process of a site with an interesting story to actually being something which is, it's, like, it's really exciting to see. Yeah. It's emotional to see um, local people, you know, be inspired by their heritage and their prehistory and really mm-hmm. to get it and understand the value of it you know we did a we had a just before the lockdown started last year we had a, a um reception in the scottish parliament that was hosted by the cult the culture secretary in scotland fiona hislop and as part of that the local msp was talking and other people talk and the msp was crying you know he was emotional because he he thought you know if only when I was a kid living, growing up in um, in Western Scotland, I'd had I'd had a chance to engage with our heritage in this way, and and he was really emotional about the potential for changing a part of his constituency. So it really affects people in a way that, yeah. as archaeologists, it's often e- easy to become blasé and think, well, okay, it's five thousand years old. Okay, I see that every other week, but you know, actually, for other people, it blows their minds, and it's and it's and it's really powerful. Yeah. So. Prehistory is something which, of course, is interesting for its own right, and we should continue to understand the value of prehistory. But I think also prehistory has a has a resonance for people today that is not really properly tapped into, and that's one of the key things that sort of drives my 
my research just now. Yes, but it's not it's not just so an idea that, that you pay uh, lip service. I mean, my impression is that you're very much active. You're very much part of the glue, you know, bringing people together with the heritage mm. that's uh, not necessarily under their feet, but certainly in their uh, I- environment. So I don't know if you want to say any more about that, but, you know, my mm. hat is off to oh, that aspect of, of what you do, yeah. uh, Kenny. I think it's about, it's about almost being a facilitator. I don't know. I mean, I think yeah. that obviously... Yeah. Obviously, I have an expertise and a knowledge and an experience that people value locally, you know, and I work for the university, which gives me additional credibility. But ultimately, I think what matters to people in Faithfully is that they see me being there. I mean, I haven't been there for a while because of restrictions and so on. But, you know, I spent a lot of time there. I was on the ground. I was visible. I did a lot of evening talks and walking tours, school workshops. And I think that actually the thing that, that, that really helped was just the fact that I w- they could see that I, I wanted to be there and I wanted to help out and wanted to do things. So that was really important. Yeah. To actually, and it wasn't always it wasn't always about doing the archaeology. It was about turning up for meetings and you know public meetings and um, committee meetings and and just do, sort of doing the hard miles to really show that you're dedicated and and mm-hmm. I think that people respond to that as well because they realise that you're serious and you're mm-hmm. not and I'm not just there to further my career or to yeah, yeah, get another yeah, research yeah. article or a research grant, you know, I'm actually there because I'm, I, I want to help and I want to make a difference, which again, mm. sounds quite idealistic, but you know, for, for someone who spent my whole career being a prehistorian for a long time, I didn't imagine I could make a difference to people's lives. Um, other than the fact that they might know more about curses monuments, but actually now uh, I feel yeah. as if, you know, I can, I can do things that are potentially helpful and useful. Yeah. And so that's, it's very rewarding. Lovely. Good to hear. Rupert, I interrupted you. You were about to... No, that's all right. I was just it was back with the Cocknell Stone and Ludwig oh, Mann. I was uh, I just I just wanted to ask Kenny what he thought. It's it's only a throwaway thing, really, but Ludwig Mann painting the Cocknell Stone like that. Brilliant research or arrogant desecration? <laughs> well, I think as always with Ludwig Mann, it's probably both of those things. I mean, I think that <laughs> I, and I think that I, I, I can only admire the the kind of the, the tenacious attitude that he had towards doing that. I mean, it's actually an incredibly creative act, um, and it, it would have taken a lot of hard work and a lot of planning and a lot of thinking for him to do it. And also, um, I think it was a it was in some ways it was a brave thing to do as well because he was he was kind of in a sense setting himself up for a lot of a lot of um, pushback which he got. But on the other hand, also it was it was reckless. You know, I mean, you, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't matter whether it's the nineteen thirties or the or the two thousand and tens. You know, you, you shouldn't really be taking oil paints to a prehistoric monument. <laughs> and, I think, and I'm fairly sure that that man <laughs> knew that back at the time as well. But the, the the context of that was that he was he'd been ill for quite a while because he was under investigation. No, not investigation. There was there was analysis going on of his theories about prehistoric measures. He was he was very interested in. Oh, right. he, he kind of he kind of came up with um, megalithic yards before Tom did in a sense, but he called oh, them alpha yeah. and beta units. Mm-hmm. And he ha- he had all these theories about it. And then there was a, a committee set up by the Glasgow Archaeological Society and Glasgow Geological Society just ex- just to investigate Tom's theories and basically to debunk them. And so I think that Tom might have had a nervous breakdown and he had a few years when he was on the back foot. And it's just, well, it's, it's all of it. It's all of it daft, really, when you think about it now. But, you know, this is the kind of the high, the high yeah. um, sort of stakes world of the Glasgow cultural heritage scene. Um, and he'd, he'd been president of the Glasgow Archaeology Society. So it was, I think it felt like a fall from grace for him and people were essentially didn't believe him and didn't <laughs> trust his theories. And his theories were, were, were really eccentric, to say the least. Um, mm-hmm. But... So in 1937, when he painted the Cock on the Stone, I feel as if he was making a comeback. He kind of, he'd got better again. He'd been, he'd been um, given control of the excavations of the Druid Temple site at Nappers, which is his kind of the high point of his career in terms of his public popularity, because he was, he was a very famous figure in Glasgow at the time. Um, and, and basically, the painting of the Cochno Stone was in preparation for the visit of the Glasgow Archaeology Society on a trip he organised for them to go and visit Napper, the Druid Temple site, and the Cochno Stone. So for me, it was, I think it was, a, it was um, if you excuse the expression, it was Tom was kind of to the establishment. He was like saying, you know, <laughs> I've been investigated for three years. The, the committee investigated couldn't prove me wrong. And uh, furthermore, here is an illustration. My theories are right in Technicolor. In your face, and I think that's what I think that's what it was. It was a lot of it was about that. It was about man kind of basically oh, saying, "I'm back and I'm right." Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, and and he was back, but he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, <laughs> and um, yeah, and so within months, the Cockney Stone had been um, had been made a scheduled ancient monument, and um, people started to sc- scrape their name all over it, and you know, it started the trend of what happened over the next few decades. Yeah. So, so yeah. in many ways, it was a it was a brave and but also reckless act, and obviously. He <laughs> obviously wouldn't like to condone it because you know because the, the paint's still on the stone. You know that's one of the things we found we uncovered it. You know yeah. the, the, the still yellow yeah. lines meters long across the stone, so it's 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 had a a long term impact on the monument, um, and that, that's something that will yeah. probably remain there for quite a while. So before that, he'd used chalk. Yeah. You know because yeah. he went to he went to Stonehenge in 1926, and he wrote to the Ministry of Works or whatever it was called back then in England. And he said, can I visit Stonehenge? And he said, yes, you can visit Stonehenge, but don't put chalk on any of the stones. <laughs> so, so sure enough, six months later, Ludwig Mann published a newspaper article with one of the blue stones at Stonehenge covered in a chalk grid that he'd painted on it when he was on site. So he was, he was kind of, it was difficult to control. But up until Cockno, he always used chalk. So he, he chalked lots of stones. There's lots of pictures of these okay. weird grids he chalked on stones. But Cockno oh, Stone, nice. for some reason, he decided he would he wanted to go for the full oil paint experience. And we know it's oil paint because we sampled it and we got um analysis done of it. So yeah. so yeah, so it's it, it's yeah. an incredible story. It's, incredible. Know, it, it's, it's interesting because you mentioning Stonehenge again. I mean, one of the other things, um the Cochno Stone is I mean, it's immense. And yet it is so little known. Mm. And so just as an example of archaeology as a whole, you know, when you look at some of the incredible sites all over Britain and Ireland, and uh, you know, do you think that so, so many of them are so little known because of our relentless overemphasis mm. Of Wiltshire. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that I think that's exactly right. I think that the, you know there's 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 a media focus on Stonehenge, which you can see with constant stories. You know, English Heritage seem to put out a press release every few months about a Stonehenge thing, um, and and it's just I think that the perception amongst the public is probably that that you know that there's not much beyond Stonehenge that's worth knowing about. You know, if you look at a uh, British Archaeology magazine. Um, and I did I did some work on this a while ago, and I haven't um, renewed it recently, but I, I looked at the Every edition that had been since Mike Pitts became editor, and Mike's a great guy, and I, I wouldn't like to, I wouldn't want to criticize Mike at all. Um, but I mean, something like thirty percent of the covers had Stonehenge on them of British Archaeology magazine, and about we, we it, have and, to hand, hold our hands up as well, Ken. You know, it's, it's one of those it, it's the clickbait thing. If if you can legitimately yeah, get the word yeah. Stonehenge into your title, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's why that, Ludovic Mann marketed the druid temple site as scotland stonehenge yeah. you know there's like a i was looking mm. yesterday at a scrapbook of news cuttings for a blog post i'm writing yeah. um, and you know that he was sending out press releases saying this is scotland stonehenge you know so that and and actually he might have been the first person that started to use stonehenge as this kind of marketing tool and it is an absolutely and you know and, and if you want to if you want um journalists to take more of an interest if you want a story to get a bit more clicks online then yeah, mentioning Stonehenge is definitely part of that. So there's a, it's a kind of a, a circular thing. It, it's a vicious circle. It, you know, yeah. It's, yeah. It, the ar- archaeologists feed the fuel and the fire because it's good mm. for publicity and get stories in. And then if you've got a, if you've got a great story about an obscure but really incredible site in Clyde Bank, then actually it has to have something like the eccentric Ludovic Man angle or the or the community angle. Or the, yeah. the story of the stone that was buried and then uncovered. That that's actually what unlocks people's interest yeah. rather than the archaeology in its own right. So you you know, you need an angle. And mm. yeah. the Cockno Stone has got multiple angles, which is quite happy for it's, happy. It's so lovely. Um, I'm so glad, you know, we got to hear you uh, telling that tale, Kenny. It's it, it, it's great. And <laughs> uh yeah, grist to our mill. I think Ludovic Mann requires uh, further investigation, mm. don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, back to yourself, and um, really wrapping up now and asking you what uh, what's got your eye at the moment. What's uh, what you're looking to uh, going forward right now? Well, um, well, just now, partly, um, I'm waiting to hear back about the funding application about my, the project to look at the column barrier, the long barrow column barrier, which I'll hopefully find out this month. But um, okay, it's hopefully something will happen there. Um, I'm working on the the third surf monogra- surf project monograph 
um, with my colleague Dean Wright. So we're writing up, well, we've mostly written up the excavations as part of the SERF project in Perth and Kinross. Mm. The excavations from 2012 to 2017, which are over about half a dozen different sites. So that's what we're working on just now, which will be a companion to the first two SERF monographs that were published in by CBA in December and are available online as um, digital downloads. Uh, and I've got a, f- a few papers I'm working on as well. I'm working on, I've been, I'm very interested in the relationship between archaeologists and lay hunters. So I've been looking mm. at the kind of history of, of, um, of what lay hunters say about archaeologists and what archaeologists say about lay hunters and, and about the kind of similarities yeah. in creative landscape practice between lay, lay, those who follow lay lines and phenomenologists. So that's something I've been trying to work on for a while. Uh, I'm trying to get up the time and energy to have a Ludovic Man podcast, which is something I've been trying to do for a while. Right. Called, called okay. mansplaining. <laughs> it's going to be called. So, so I've, got, I've got the title. So, yeah. So there's lots of stories in that to come out as well. Oh, and um, and I'm yeah. I'm, and I'm also um, going to resume excavations and field work around the the, the rock art and faithfully this summer because I'm trying to do work around every rock art panel uh, in the in the faithfully area. Um, so I've looked around about wow. four or five already, and there's more I want to do. Uh, and, and beyond that, I'm not sure really i'm sorry i'm i'm i'd like to I'd, I'd like to write a book on urban prehistory that's really my main focus but yeah. time it's difficult to find time and i don't have any research leave due for several years so it might yeah. be it might just be ruminating and just blogging and stuff like that so so i've got lots of little things but i don't have any any major yeah. projects developing that are at a stage where i really am quite ready to go public with them but yeah there's a lot a full the slate, is, uh, there's always too much stuff going on you know i've always got so many different things happening um mm-hmm. everything ends yes. up um, just becoming a jumble in my mind so um and I th- yeah, it's something that we should be grateful for not uh not feeling awkward about it, isn't it really yeah, yeah. Uh, well kenny it's just uh it, it's been wonderful thank you. um thank you. it's so glad to have uh, got you on yeah it's uh, been great finally. thank you very much and uh Really, we we, uh, we could talk for hours, but we, we can't. Will, uh, sometimes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there's yeah. Yeah, there's, so, there's more there's more to be talked about. So, so yeah, there, there certainly is. Yes, yeah. We should yeah. do it again, really. But but for now, just uh, thank you so much yeah. for joining us. Yeah. Thank you our, to our listeners and uh, and viewers for watching, and I uh, uh, hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we'll uh, see you all very soon. Thanks a lot. Yeah. We still do. Bye bye.